Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining this seminar series organized by the Empathic Computing Laboratory. I'm your host, Aladdin, and our guest speaker for today is Suzanne Dicker, who is currently a research professor at New York University. Her research interests are in neuroscience, EEG, and brain-computer interaction. She led many impactful projects and uh, uh, many impactful projects to support the communi community-based initiative and to learn more about human brain research. The title of the talk today is Using Interbrain and Interbody Biofeedback in a Real-World Neuroscience Research. The talk will be roughly an hour, followed by a brief question and answers. Uh, please join me to welcome Professor Suzanne. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, I am going to indeed share my screen. Um, let me see. Um, so while most of us interact with other people on uh, a day-to-day -day basis, uh, we know, as you know, very little about how the human brain supports real-world social dynamic interactions uh, or social experiences, right? Um, and uh, oops, that went too fast. Sorry about that. Um, and um, that's in part because we've been uh, working from a laboratory model of the social brain or uh, social cognition uh, for good reason. Um, as there's, as I don't have to explain to you, there is a, a lot uh, to say for uh, uh, conducting a research inside a laboratory uh, under controlled circumstances. Um, but the question arises to what extent we are ready or should be testing the laboratory model of human cognition in real world context. And so I do that by uh, following a reciprocal or cyclical model where I pair laboratory research with real world uh, uh, research, the more messy stuff uh, that happens outside uh, in our everyday experiences. Um, and to do that, I work with um, uh, institutions and uh, people outside of the laboratory environment, so outside of the lab, like uh, art institutions, museums, uh, and educators and schools. And I use hyperscanning uh, as my tool of choice, one might say, to uh, uh, conduct this real world uh, social, uh, uh, social research where hyperscanning, for those who might not be familiar, is uh, basically, a, the, a, re refers to the method of recording brain activity or body activity or physio neurophysiology from multiple people at the same time. Um, and so, for example, I've been um, leading or conducting a series of studies where we uh, work with uh, inside the classroom to understand to what extent brain to brain synchrony or inter brain coupling um, is uh, indicative of group interactions and then specifically social dynamics and engagement in the classroom. So the classroom is kind of a great real world laboratory uh, because it allows for some version of experiment, form of experimental control, right? You can tell, ask students to sit still and shut up. And uh, you can also tell them to do uh, uh, you know, a, a little task for five minutes and then switch to another task for five minutes, right? So it has a very experimental uh, uh, design flavor to it um, without it being too weird to uh, ask people to do different things. Um, so concretely, we uh, paired with groups of schools in New York City, um, and we basically took over the classroom for the entire school year, uh, where we worked with students at the beginning of the year to teach them how to use the EEG equipment. We were using portable emotive headsets, um, and we also included them as much as possible in the design of the studies that they were then were going to be uh, the research subjects, uh, which consisted of basically the teacher who you're seeing here on the left, um, teaching his regular class materials to the students uh, for uh, the entire semester. 
And it was very helpful for us that students were involved in it. They were the best subjects I've ever had because they were invested in this in the work. Uh, but at the same end, uh, we also could really use their help because we only had 50 minutes to do the setup. And so they, and they helped uh, each other, basically. But anyway, to go back to the, um, uh, to the research, we uh, worked with two schools and uh, 12. And this is now also extended this to more classrooms. Uh, but uh, from the first two studies, it was two schools and 12 students and a teacher each. Um, and we had different instruction activities and then some baseline connections. Um, and then we asked what, to whether the extent to which brain to brain synchrony during class predicted classroom engagement and uh, social dynamics. Um, for example, we asked students how much they enjoyed each teaching style. Um, unsurprisingly, um, they were not as into a unit directional teaching where a teacher was lecturing non-interactively or reading their materials, uh, but they very much enjoyed group discussions and videos. Um, and although the correlation is not shown here, we saw this pairing in the brain data uh, reflected in coupling between the students as a group, uh, but also as individuals. So uh, how there is a ton of factors that predicted synchrony of each of individual students uh, um, uh, to the teacher and to other students in their class as a function of self-report. So for example, how much they liked their teacher um, was predictive of uh, student to student synchrony and student to teacher synchrony, um, how focused they felt at any mo any uh, during class uh, was predictive of uh, synchrony um, and also social traits like how much students enjoyed being in a classroom environment or sorry in a social environment like are you the kind of person who joins the cheerleader team or are you more the kind of person who would you know sit uh, in a corner and read a book by themselves that was actually predictive of synchrony in the classroom and the same was true for some uh, empathic personality traits like personal distress so those kids who reported higher personal distress showed less synchrony with the group um, and what i find most interesting and compelling and we're seeing this in individual brain data as well is that um, this is true f even in the absence of any social interaction. Just being in a social context predicts how, uh, like your your brain data predicts your empathic, um, your, sorry, your empathic personality predicts your neural indices, uh, both in synchrony and in individual traces. So why would you bring people into the classroom and go through this ordeal is because you can also ask questions about uh, actual real time interaction and how that might uh, fit, how that might um, uh, come online uh, in the brain, right? So uh, to illustrate, we uh, ask questions about social dynamics in the classroom. Uh, before each class, um, students were asked to sit facing uh, the person who was sitting next to them. And so the assignment, seat assignment was random each class. Um, and then they turned to the teacher Oops. after uh, this two minute uh, interaction. So you have to imagine um, they these are teenagers. So there was, and we asked them to sit still, but obviously there was a lot of giggling. Maybe you, they were sitting in front of like the person they had a crush on or whatever, right? So uh, there was definitely stuff happening and uh, behaviorally. Um, and then they turned to the lecture or the video. Um, and then this then allowed us to ask about whether students who were sitting next to each other um, and compare them to students who were not sitting next to each other, uh, but also draw a comparison between students who were sitting next to each other but had uh, and had engaged in face to face eye contact versus students who were sitting next to each other and had not engaged on this in this face to face contact before the class right. Um, and what we saw is a, was a main effect where during the class interbrain synchrony between those pairs of students that had faced each other was highest overall compared to students who were not facing each other or sitting next to each other or not. Um, and interestingly, uh, we also saw that, and I keep on forgetting to add the other groups as a comparison. So um, uh, we saw that social closeness between students was only predictive uh, of brain-to-brain -brain synchrony during learning for that group of people who, students who had interacted before class. Uh, so the green, you have to imagine the green and the blue uh, were basically flat lines uh, for, in terms of the correlations. 
And this is really interesting because students had known each other since they were three or four. They had gone, like, it's not like the, these 17 year olds suddenly, you know, were like, oh, hey, I like you. And then connected to, uh, to each other. And that was reflected in their brain synchrony. There's something about reviving uh, that social connectedness if you do this right before, uh, before you're, in, you're, you're entering a class, for example. Um, so we're seeing that a ton of factors, right? Class appreciation, teacher likability, focus, social closeness, empathy, and group affinity uh, all predict interbrain synchrony. Um, and obviously it would be great, uh, unlikely, but great that there was some form of an overarching, you know, unifying mechanism as to why all of these factors uh, predict interbrain synchrony. Um, and I mean, this is a kind of, you know, shared attention is a place to start or shared engagement, but obviously um, those of you who study attention or engagement will know that it's not enough in the sense that um, it doesn't have a lot of explanatory power. Um, but um, it does help uh, to begin to draw a model about of like how synchrony and engagement in different can and attention can actually, uh, sorry, how attention in different ways in the different ways we talk about attention can predict synchrony. So for example, there are, um, if I come into a social environment, uh, I bring my own personality traits and my neural architecture and my mental states and my priors to the table. Um, and then the same is true for Aladdin, right? Like he has his own personality traits, his own brain, um, his own uh, mental states and his own priors. Um, and then when we interact with each other and, and our brains might synchronize to each other, um, this could happen, for example, as a function of exogenous stimuli, like um, uh, the, uh, I don't know, a, a speech that we're listening to or music or whatever. And those are interaction independent synchronizers. Um, and then there's social behavior that would predict uh, synchrony and uh, help us establish a common ground um, and social closeness, right? So all these factors in their own ways predict synchrony, synchrony or synchronic coupling uh, uh, between people. And to illustrate um, for the classroom context, for example, we might have the teacher whose speech is an input with a temporal structure and then students who are not engaged in kind of the, you know, the nightmare scenario of any teacher or a pe person giving a speech, they're not synchronized to, they're not paying attention. So their brains are not in training or locking to the speech of the teacher. And they're also not uh, in training or synchronizing with each other. Um, in the opposite world, ideal world, everybody's paying extremely close attention. And so they're locking to the speech and therefore also synchronizing with each other. Um, the real world is probably comprised of uh, different way, uh, different attention profiles in different moments in time. Um, so social behavior is another example where it is relevant. So we have a series of studies where we record EEG and video during child adult interactions uh, in kids with AD, with uh, kids with ADD, um, sorry ASD, and typically developing kids in both uh, caregiver child and clinician child interactions um, when they're either engaging with an object or engaging socially. Um, and what we're seeing is that all these factors interact with each other basically, right? So um, kids lo look, uh, there's more eye contact during social engagement than optic engagement, but this difference is stronger for caregivers. And then when we look at the brain, we see that the um, synchrony change from object engagement to social engagement is stronger for typically developing versus autistic um, kids. Um, so this is just illustrates what we is intuitive, but often has been ignored in the past is that if you study a social disorder or social context, it makes sense that you do, um, uh, it matters who you talk to, it matters what you do, and it matters who you are, right? So studying it in the absence of such interactions may make you, may, uh, you may miss, miss something. 
Um, and uh, this also illustrates like uh, neural architecture differences. So for example, baseline differences in alpha frequencies where you might get drift or maybe the attentional profiles are completely different between two people and that in itself will cause these uh, non-synchronized patterns. Um, and we've done studies in all, in a bunch of different, sorry, I'm trying to, uh, sorry about this. Uh, different contexts, uh, including uh, classrooms at different times of day and team studies, um, beginning with therapy, um, diff age differences, parent-child interactions in immigrant, uh, immigrant families, um, and a tool that we're using throughout um, uh, to get buy-in or engagement from the public in museums and uh, schools or other or, or community centers is by building uh, real-time hyperscanning feedback tools as kind of a conversation starter for these groups of uh, pe uh, populations that we're studying. So um, about a decade ago, Matthias Ostrich and I developed um, a uh, tool that allowed us to uh, record data, sorry, from multiple people at the same time, and then visualize the extent to which uh, brain activity becomes synchronized between people uh, into various outputs. So this, for example, is a um, neurofeedback tool where you can try to sync up your brain waves as much as possible every time the, it meets a threshold. Uh, synchrony score goes up and then you can like win a top score compare yourself to people next uh, before you or after you um, and so this has turned out to be a very powerful tool to bring uh, science to the public in education and outreach environments um, we can very readily illustrate that you know this is not a mind reading device right so you just have to show people the raw brain tra brain traces to help uh, them understand and by making uh, by them participating in these like five minute interactions you can also um, make um, the experimental design very tangible and reverse inference right so from the perspective of one example of a dyad, we can't tell you whether you should get divorced or married or whether, you know, like this makes no sense, right? Based on these five minutes, um, but people are very prone to reverse inference around uh, around data, right? So it's a very, uh, very intuitive way of illustrating this. Um, and we've done many different ways of uh, visualizing or sonifying uh, synchrony between people. Uh, and I'll just illustrate a couple. So oh, um, in the mutual wave machine, uh, people sit in a dome where they're surrounded by light patterns that grow and shrink as a function of their, uh, syn their synchrony. Um, like here's an image, here's a video from a black box theater where you, they, people also see a real time, uh, see like the, um, sorry, uh, a real time video feed of themselves emerge behind the person that they're looking at. Um, and we've had um, over 5,000 people participate in this installation across Europe and um, North America. And I'm going to show you data from the Banaki Museum in Greece, uh, where half of the participants were um, uh, half of the participants were told explicitly that um, the, what they were seeing had something to do with their synchrony and half of the participants were not given uh, this information. Um, and so that allows it to ask whether, you know, showing people or motivating people through awareness of, so, of a social feedback paradigm can actually help uh, increase their social connectedness somehow. Um, and so we asked whether brain-to-brain -brain synchrony varies as a function of uh, neurofeedback, um, uh, but also of social closeness um, and personality traits um, and mental states. So we had questionnaires that they, we asked them. Um, and obviously we had what one might call less than suboptimal recording conditions because this was in a museum setting with very low grade equipment. Um, but we had a lot of people um, and we also used tools um, that allowed us to, um, or tools, sorry, metrics to compute synchrony um, that um, really try to minimize, like have the benefit of minimizing um, instantaneous correlations that are drawn, that are caused by environmental noise. So we find, and this replicates the study of what we found in, this, in the uh, school studies that those couples with lower personal distress has had higher overall synchrony. 
Um, and then for mental states and neurofeedback, we found that changes over time uh, predicted synchrony increases or decreases. So for example, those pairs who remained more focused, um, as uh, you may be aware from your own experiments, um, people become less focused over the course of an experiment, right? Overall, it makes a lot of sense. You get less enthusiastic, even if it's only 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, but those whose so whose focus went down less showed actually an increase in synchrony over time. Um, and we also saw that, uh, that um, this increase in synchrony appeared only for the group who was told explicitly about the neurofeedback nature of the environment. They showed more synchrony in the second half. Um, so that raises questions about whether, um, uh, whether it might help improve social communication, and then also whether the hyperscanning neurofeedback might actually be used as a possible intervention tool to help improve social communication in the long run. Uh, another a very valuable tool, uh, way that um, that uh, neurofeedback of, uh, of interbrain synchrony or social neurofeedback more generally has helped us is to really use it as a tool, a conversation starter, a tool for in exploring uh, synchrony and social communication in, uh, in interdisciplinary contexts. So um, to illustrate, for example, the um, uh, compatibility racer, um, uh, the, the synchrony is, mo is in the compatibility racer, synchrony is translated into the speed of a cart that goes faster as synchrony increases um, and then slows down as it decreases. Um, and here, what we saw is that people really, really, really want to debrief after they've had this experience. They want to talk to each other and they want to talk to you about what strategies actually makes you synchronize more, what makes the card go faster. And people naturally start hypothesis testing uh, through these kinds of experiences. And so we did the same for the mutual, mutual wave machine when after the experience, we asked people to self-report what they thought uh, all the strategies that they used to sync up their brain waves. Um, and then after that, we, cla we, we, we classified these, um, these different uh, strategies into, into separate categories and found that um, those different categories of trying to synchronize or strategies actually predicted synchrony offline in different ways. So uh, eye contact, predict synchrony differently than joint action does. And for EG at least, um, thinking the same thing wasn't a very successful strategy when it comes to increasing synchrony, which kind of makes sense, right? Because EG is time locked and thoughts uh, or trying to like uh, telepathize thoughts might not be very time locked, right? So um, uh, those of you who are familiar with neural similarity research know that we do see this kind of joint thought or shared intentionality effects in fMRI, for example. Um, but you might also then ask questions about whether synchrony is always better, like what's the role of individual agency? And maybe it's not so much about always getting the, high, the highest synchrony, which is what a lot of people who walk into the space of synchrony or hyperscanning research kind of uh, step into it thinking that more and better, more is better, right? Um, but for example, uh, in the movie E.T., um, which I don't know if you've seen it, have, have people here seen the movie? Um, there's, um, there's a scene where Elliot, uh, E.T. gets sick from being on earth um, and Elliot um, also gets very sick with him. Um, and then there's doctors, as you can see in hazmat suits, and they have uh, they have them wired with all sorts of sensors on their uh, on their uh, heads and on their bodies. Um, and then the doctors say, well, there's a perfect coherence between their brain activity and their heart rate. Um, and that's a bad thing in this context, right? Like this perfect coherence um, makes it that um, uh, ET is dragging down Elliot with him. And only when this coherence or synchrony breaks can Elliot have a, be uh, independent. Um, and you can think of various different contexts within which you don't really want 
uh, the other person to synchronize with you, right? So uh, for the brain, maybe not so much, but for physiology, a therapist may want to have a different reaction and we may not want to like have the similar emotional states or fluctuations in physiology as their patient, but rather have a counterbalancing. And as maybe some of you know, um, uh, a lot of the work more recently has moved into thinking not so much more is better, but that it's all about the balancing act and the perfect, you know, like uh, that a good experience, a good social experience. If you look at the internal time course, there's fluctuations in synchrony and that that predicts uh, outcomes more than anything. Um, and uh, visualizations also help uh, us think through uh, the the more, more is better, a synchrony is better in other ways. So uh, in group context, for example, here we're looking at a top view of six people whose brain uh, brain waves the, the on the real time fluctuations of interbrain synchrony uh, in a network of six people. And we're seeing that the orange one is quote unquote winning, right? Like it's like uh, turning out to be the hub. Um, and, but you also can like, just by looking at this, think about ways in which maybe it's not so, you don't really want to be the orange one. Maybe you want to be the independent thinker, or maybe if you're in a team constellation, it's actually really important that not everybody's on top of each other all the time for variation purposes, right? Um, to really get at the bottom of like, or to think about more deeply about constructs of synchrony and connectedness, we've also started working with dancers um, and specifically the dance group Isika Amsterdam, who've been thinking about notions around synchrony for a very long time. Um, and we've worked with them uh, on uh, workshops uh, and uh, performances. So here's an example of a performance that was done at the Ballet National de Marseille a couple of years ago, uh, where um, the, uh, these are vignettes from the choreography of the dance company uh, around synchrony. Uh, and whenever the, the visuals and the sound patterns are generated by their movements and these sound, these visuals are pulled together, as you can see, and pushed apart, like they're kind of like slurped into the center. Um, and that's dictated by the brain activity of the audience. So there are two audience members that are basically puppeteering the dancers uh, in terms of uh, by pulling them together or pushing them apart as their synchrony fluctuates. Um, and with the group through like both movement and a conversation and visualizations and sonifications of synchrony and movements, we've like, we then started building like a taxonomy of shared vocabulary, like what are the forms that generate synchrony or coupling, uh, like, uh, and especially focusing on notions of simultaneity and togetherness, which is very intuitive. We know what the difference is. I don't have to explain it to you if something is simultaneous or together, but it's actually really hard to do. And it's also really hard to quantify uh, when something is together or the same, right? Um, units, like you can, what can all like synchronize or couple to each other? Um, and then also vehicles for synchrony, like anticipation and resonance, resonance tuning and feedback, um, which could be, you know, like, you know, prediction and prediction error, like those kinds of, there's versions of that that we use in our everyday scientific vocabulary that are very close to what dancers or movers might do um, to describe their own uh, thing. And so we then design studies um, that are at the same time performances around these questions of togetherness and simultaneity. Um, and because EEG, as I'm assuming many of you know, is horrible for studying uh, movement, uh, we can we construct the, um, oops, we use open pose uh, to uh, quantify movement and movement synchrony during the dance phrase, and then have moments of silence, as you can see on the left, uh, of like a couple of minutes, both before and after each dan dance phrase to, um, and then use the EG from only that period to see if we can predict um, a synchrony during in movement uh, from the brain data either before or after. And so we can then also ask whether these different constructs actually map onto uh, different interbrain synchrony metrics uh, specifically, right? So I mentioned a couple earlier, but I've been kind of glossing over interbrain coupling as if it was one 
beasts, but uh, it's not, right? Like any neural measures, there are many different ways to quantify synchrony or quantify coupling. So synchrony is actually also not a great term, but uh, I hope you forgive me for using it sloppily. Um, so um, uh, it's like, and this, these, here's a, just a couple of examples of <clears throat> the kinds of metrics that are out there that can quantify uh, coupling. And so the big task that lies ahead of us would be to map all these different psychological constructs on different methods. And maybe that works actually, but we don't know yet. Um, so I showed you, for example, these different strategies and you saw that there were different, uh, different metrics that predict uh, different kinds of joint action or eye contact um, in different frequency ranges. And when we look at, at like um, uh, the mutual wage machine data, we actually do see a pattern, uh, at least when we look at projected power correlations and imaginary coherence, where um, there's a co-modulation of synchrony in the lower frequency ranges in power uh, and the higher frequency in coherence. Uh, in other words, those pairs who showed higher projected power correlations around eight hertz showed also higher imaginary coherence around um, 20 hertz. And so one possible way of starting to think about this would be that, you know, uh, take again, Aladdin and myself, you know, we're having a conversation uh, or we're in this kind of, you know, mutual wave machine environment with sound and light patterns around us and we're engaging. Um, and this is 10 minutes. And during the 10 minutes, my attention flows, in, like I flow in and out of attention, right? Like nobody is attentive for like a full 10 minutes or 45 minutes. These are, these are their attentional flows. And that's true for Aladdin as well. Um, and then when uh, it naturally follows that if our, you know, moments like attentive states co-modulate, there are also more windows of opportunity, one might say, one might say so we're attentive at the same time to create like shared representations or internal models which might arguably be, rep be represented in higher uh, frequency ranges. So there's some work uh, from Elana Zion Golimbic and, uh, and Saskia Hagens, for example, and others to suggest such, such a model of uh, lower frequencies attention and then higher frequencies sh shared representation. Um, and we also saw that like for the neurofeedback group, for example, that only the neurofeedback group show more synchrony in the second half, uh, but the jury's still out on the specificity of this, right? So because we didn't see any difference when we looked at sham versus true neurofeedback for our metric, but there are many ways and many ways that you can measure synchrony. And so it's uh, not unlikely that the one that we use is motivating, but not necessarily specific enough that you can tag onto and learn from the synchrony over time. And so what we've done is we've built hybrid harmony, which is a hyperscanning neurofeedback uh, tool um, that is still in progress, but you can find it online if you like. Um, where you can record data from multiple people simultaneously. Um, and then critically, you can uh, uh, change the parameters or uh, different connectivity metrics that are built in. And then you can uh, use OSC or LSL for your preferred visualization uh, mode after that. But you're not tied to one specific connectivity metric and you can compare them to each other even. Um, and this is all paired up with um, uh, high pipe with a hyperscanning Python pipeline um, that is spearheaded by Guillaume Dumas, where we are trying to, uh, you know, build like uh, create a pipeline that has similar um, pre processing parameters, but then you can uh, compute different interbrain or interbrain connectivity um, features. So I am going to, let's see. Um, so just as a final note, I think that like we know that uh, rhythmicity matters in synchrony, right? Like what you do matters um, and the kind of interactions that you have with each other. So I've talked mostly about um, dance on the one hand, which is ryth rhythmic, and then conversation on the other hand as if they were the same thing. But clearly that is not true, right? And so one great example of this is 
um, uh, online communication. So over the past couple of years, we've oh, obviously been Zooming a lot and we've also experienced this general Zoom fatigue, fatigue right? That people have reported that you don't get from face-to-face -face interactions. Um, and that's like this inexplicable condition uh, that you might get. Uh, but if you are like even after like a couple of years of interacting over Zoom, um, you can still play, you know, do this test where you can ask people um, if it's anybody's birthday in the room. And then uh, like if somebody says yes, and then you're like, oh, let's all sing happy birthday together. And there's always at least one person or two people who've been in Zoom rooms uh, for very often throughout the years but who are surprised still that there's that you cannot sing happy birthday together in a zoom room like becomes like a full fledged chaotic breakdown I don't know how many people here have done this have tried this. You know? Yeah, it doesn't work right <laughs> like all those like uh, uh, they lied to us like all the the videos of people playing together that was all like recorded it was not recorded simultaneously because music, even though zoom is really, really good at like you know. Uh, not having too many breakdowns and like the minimizing the delay, it's not good enough for the rhythmic, uh, like the stuff that has like really tight timing associated with it. And that really illustrates the difference between conversation and, uh, and song, for example. But that doesn't mean that conversation isn't bound to rhythmic rules, right? Or, you know, that there are really, there's really beautiful models about turn-taking dynamics, for example, and how these are so tightly locked to the experiences of the conversation or like they're oscillators like uh, and the and and we are and we also know from social uh, psychology research that play around with delays, for example, that um, it, if you have a slight delay, this actually uh, is detrimental to the experience of the conversation and this this work was already done before zoom even uh, you know entered the stage in all of our lives. Um, because what happens is that if you are because of these tight these these strict rules around turn taking dynamics if you, for example, if Aladdin would, uh, for example, like um, take his turn a little too early, I would think that he would, I would feel like he was interrupting me, or if he were to wait just a little bit too long, I would feel like he was not listening to what I was saying, right, which is detrimental to the experience. The problem is that it's not, that it's not as, at, as to serve as a lot of this is subconscious, and I might just walk away with uh, not liking Aladdin, uh, as opposed to thinking that, oh, our turn-taking dynamics were all off because of some like interaction, uh, uh, faulty interaction system, right? And so in harmonic dissonance, we actually test this like distinction between face-to-face -face versus face-to-screen-based interactions because we're looking a lot at like enrichments of screen-based interactions as we're doing this so much, but solving the problem of this delay is near impossible. So we ask people to do body conversation tasks facing each other um uh face to face and then also do similar tasks through screens um uh, where and there's actually audio to this as well so here maybe let's go back you can hear that um there's a violin and piano and uh drums and everybody has their own instrument literally uh, their own visual and their own sound. Um, and so you create concerts together. Um, and then we can compare these body conversations tests through the screens and face to face. Obviously, there's a lot of things that are different between face to face uh, and screen based. Um, but it is interesting that initial initial findings do suggest that indeed, you know, uh, you are uh, doing much more synchrony at zero lag if you're face to face than if you are interacting through a screen and but people compensate by and I'm not showing this by moving around more right like so there's much richer movement but it's less at a zero lag. Um, and what's the zero lag, what's the synchrony good for and the rhythmicity It's like it's often in a combination of information transfer verbally like through conversation or song um, and uh, really building uh, this common ground and construct together, um, which is illustrated, I think, uh, with this uh, project that I wanted to close with. Um, which is between uh, Resident, who is a uh, rap artist, and uh, Bad Bunny, who is also um, an artist, uh, a pop artist from, they're both from Puerto Rico. Um, and Resident started a project 
um, with a bunch of Latin American uh, musicians to try to find common ground. Um, and uh, we, we went into the studio and recorded their brain activity, visualized their synchrony, and they tried a bunch of different things. And what I wanted to show you is when they try to remember a song together, uh, which really shows all the factors that I was uh, talking about earlier. Pero gracias a la diferencia generacional, solo una canción conectó con ambos y fue un reggaeton. Cuando chulín, chulín, cumplada, cuando colín, colín. Si no te falta, no sabes esa canción, todo no lo Como es, cuando chulín, chulín, cumplada, habla un que mi lengua se cae, dice, ojalá, ojalá, ojalá que tú seas mi madre. So you can see in this, uh, and we know, we all have had this experience, right? Like when you're trying to remember, the only way that you could ever repeat a song is by doing it with somebody else, because you're building on each other, and you're also using, you know, the template of the rhythm and the sound to do so. But it's this interaction and this paying attention, the complexity of these kinds of interactions that together create this shared memory uh, with other people. Um, and that's it. That's what I wanted to talk about to you today. Thank you so much. Oh, amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. This, a lot of uh, interesting projects and uh, definitely a lot of interse intersection with some of the project we do in the lab. And um, if anyone has a question, please uh, either ask or raise your hand or leave it in the chat. I want to ask, I will start us with one question, if you don't mind, Suzanne. I like the visualization of the interbrain synchronicity. Um, I was wondering if there was a test about which visualization people preferred, uh, or, or is that important at all? And whether when they are seeing the visualization, does it help or increase or decrease the synchronicity? Um, yeah, I'll start with this one. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, um, I don't, we, we test out a lot of things, like especially with the uh, movement synchrony. Um, a lot of that is individually. We don't, we haven't test, like, like the testing, we know anecdotally that some things work better than others for people to stay engaged with each other and to be informed. Um, but we haven't done systematic tests uh, between um, different sub, uh, uh, you know, groups of participants around preference. I was actually coincidentally twice today, uh, feedback, uh, things came, the same feedback question came up in a different context, namely sound uh, feedback on meditation, like you like individual device, you have like an individual, like a device, like a muse or whatever, and it gives you sound uh, when you're getting into a meditative state or a dream state or whatever. And um, two people independently were talking about this er this earlier when, uh, and saying that like the, uh, the intuition is that if you get into more of a brain, like a, a dream state is that your sound would reflect that, right? Like you get these like, I don't know, maybe it's birds or maybe it's like something that is a richer environment. But the effect of that is actually that by enriching the sound, you're pulled out of that whatever state it is in. It's like somebody's waking you up. And so this is a contrast between whether you're trying to transmit to somebody else, hey, this is a state I'm in versus what the reflection or the sonification is actually doing to yourself. And I'm always surprised. I mean, like, I know like you are probably doing a much better job at this, but like in, in thinking about it, but like oftentimes when you think, when you look at, you know, 
literature on neurofeedback, um, they kind of gloss over this part, right? Like it's off, you, sometimes in the papers, you don't even see like a visualization of it, or they're just like a dot, you know, or fishes is like, what does fishes have, what do fishes have to do with this? You know, it's like, you know, it's this gamified structure, but there's, you know, and I think that through collaboration with like designers and uh, it, like you get to a much richer place and more natural place too, I think, uh, uh, to reflect the synchrony. And uh, sorry, I know this is a bit, a bit of a ramble, but I've had like presented things like this, like real-time flows to research groups who are then, who hadn't really thought about it. And they're like, oh, now you can think about it. You can use these visualizations also to think yourself about what you're really trying to get at and the contracts that you're trying to measure and represent. Uh, thank you for that question. It's a really important one, I think. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Gunn. Um, thank you very much, Suzanne, for the great talk. Um, first of all, um, I had a question regarding um, the visualization you had with some dots um, visualizing how synchrony are there within the group. Um, I think mm -hmm. you used the term hub person who was um, standing out as an orange dot. Um, I, I was um, wondering how can only one person be um, standing out from the group, even that um, if you if you say that person is more synchronized with others, then um, that 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 sounds like um, there is a lot of common things going on within the group. So so uh, maybe um, having two people having more synchronized rather than um, I was expecting more like two dots or two persons being more synchronized uh, rather than just one single person standing out from the group. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more on how how that um, works and what does the visualization actually mean? Okay, so our, um, so you're talking about this, right? Hold on. This guy? Yes, yes, this one, hop score. Yeah, so I'm not entirely sure if I understand the question completely. So this... This one, I mean, this is trying to like, there, there's pull and push stuff happening here for the 3D, you know, like um, uh, to compensate for that. For that. But um, are, you're talking about the purple guy that stays out. I'm not entirely sure no. if I understand or no. No, no, the orange guy. I think when you ex you were explaining this visualization. Oh no, I was. Um, I I might have misspoken. Sorry, I was talking about the orange guy as being like the most synchronous to the rest. So if you think. In group learning, for example, often we think about like uh, there's like the common denominator dude basically is this guy who's most likely most entrained to the stimulus, for example. Um, and then this person is least entrained to the stimulus and would be an outlier. Um, and so the question then is, uh, in general, you think about this as a, you might think about this as like a bad thing, but if you see it visualized, then you might also start thinking about it more as a, uh, as like the necessity of variation within a group of people, right? So you need um, a, like a conversation or a solution. Uh, this is very abstract, might become richer if you have more variation. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the case that everybody's completely locked in and the same uh, um, within a group. But I'm, I feel like I'm still not fully understanding your question though. I'm sorry about yeah, that. I was, I, was, um, I was just wondering if, um, would be more likely to have um, a pair of persons standing out rather than just a single person. But um, since you were just mentioning probably, um, would it be fair enough if I think of that orange person probably is like a teacher in a teaching setting. So so he's more um, in, in, in coherence with- yeah, Sure, others. or within a group of, yeah, or that, that could be, or within a group of students. Um, the uh, like we use synchrony as a proxy for entrainment measures, right? So then this could be the person who's most entrained to an invisible uh, stimulus that is the teacher. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's okay. great. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, do we have another question from Misha? Hi. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you, Suzanne, for uh, sharing this uh, very useful information. And thank you for making the very useful high pipe model with Guilam, um, because it's very useful. Um, I hope to leverage, leverage that as well. Um, 
I would like to ask about, um, have you ever tried uh, looking at this interbrain synchrony when people are separated geographically? Because what I could see uh, so far, like those people are, they have a meeting face to face. So have you tried like when they, you know, uh, one person is in US, the other one is maybe somewhere in, you know, Canada or something like that. And then, okay. pardon, uh, sorry, just one more. Have you tried any other, what do you, have you found like any other than eyes have any like, like nonverbal behaviors or like, um, you know, kind of uh, gesture stuff that influence the interbrain synchrony as people uh, communicate actually? Yeah, that's yeah. it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Oh. So the, um, uh, when it comes to geographic differences, um, uh, we haven't done systematic studies on people who are in geographically different uh, spaces. One study I do want to do uh, is, uh, uh, let me see where this is. Oh. I'm going to go back. It, sorry about this. <laughs> there is a study that we did do with Guillaume just as a fun demo. Uh, when we were all in different places, we we, we did an, uh, a virtual interbrain synchrony connecting via VPN, uh, our headsets via VPN and then visualizing synchrony. So that can, you know, but that's, I don't think that's your question. That was just like a fun little, little gimmicky thing. Uh, one thing I really do want to do is bring uh, this study to, um, uh, to a more systematic situation where we um, look at, and now I need to find it, sorry, here you are. This, in, I don't know if you remember from, I know that I showed you a lot, like there is yeah. this one data set where people uh, have, were more synchronous after intera interacting with each other. Um, and I'm really curious what the explanation is for that, right? Like one, one possible explanation is that there is more uh, uh, directed attention to the people mm -hmm. because they're still sitting in the same room afterward, right? So they're sitting next to two people, but they might be more, their attention might be more directed to people they just interacted with. So what you would wanna do is then bring them to different rooms and see if this resonance synchrony actually persists. Is it more like acute attention or is it more like, I don't know, they st like when you sing a song together and you leave the room and the song is still lingering in your head kind of thing, is it a resonance state? So that I, that's not, doesn't exactly answer your question, but I think it gets at uh, questions of, uh, geographic distance and it also gets at the questions of like baseline synchrony that you might have um, and there's beautiful work with caregivers right like where they put caregivers and children in the scanner show that their baseline synchrony uh, when they're not in the same room actually predicts both synchrony and social uh, interaction during uh, during their day-to-day -day, uh, interactions um, and as to your second question we haven't brought in gesture like as a, um, a predictor, separate predictor, but like our body conversation task is definitely a movement, movement synchrony and bringing the two back together is like, a, would be a next step. I see. Sorry, just one more question. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a way later, like I wanna try the, um, like, uh, you know, to try something like in the real time, because when you show like um, at the very beginning, so uh, when people wear the headsets and then the software will be able like to do pre-process and also like predict. So is there a way like where um, maybe I can try this download at your software or like GUI stuff? So I would like to try that yeah. one just in case it's open source. Yeah, the hybrid harmony, you can try it. Um, it's a, a, at your own risk, I would say in the sense that like it's, a, you know, it's a, it's not in a perfect state, but any feedback would be absolutely appreciated. It's not doing online, um, uh, pre-processing um, uh, currently, but there are devices that are doing this. If you use Smarting or something that they're like doing ASR and you can then stream it after after that. So yeah, uh, Rhythm of related hybrid, uh, Relating Hybrid Harmony. There's a Frontiers article about it too. I'm happy to point you to it if you can't find it. Thanks, Susan. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ishan. Uh, Ishan has did a lot of research in the interbrain synchrony in virtual reality. So I think yeah, it would be I'm useful. Aware. Very Thanks. great work. Hopefully we can collaborate. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next question from Mark, please. Thanks, um, Suzanne. I, I, you've done so much work. I, I just want to um, ask, um, from your experience, 
what type of visual feedback produces the best um, synchrony results or, or I guess um, causes the best synchrony? So you, you showed the example of the dome, for example, with people sitting together and having um, kind of a particle visualization behind them. And then the, the two, you know, the overlapping, um, the brain uh, visualization that you had. So what, what type of visualization do you think would provide, produce the best synchrony for people? Yeah, I think this is maybe another version of uh, what Aladdin was asking earlier. Um, uh, but uh, so um, in the sense that we like don't, uh, we haven't systematically done this test. What we do find, for example, is that there are sweet spots of, uh, it depends on the on your audience as well, right? So we have different visualizations uh, uh, like with younger audiences that two heads work really well and they're really powerful. Um, there's like some starkness around the, uh, and, and so does like the, um, uh, the, the, the mutual wave machine works well, but it's a little darker and, uh, and more solemn. And so you do see, and, but again, like having tested this dynamic, uh, systematically people behave differently, uh, but we're putting them consciously in a different state. Like, are you in an art experience or are you in a fun experience or are you in like a are you in an outreach experience, right? And so that has a very strong effect. It also has an effect on what the ideal length is of the uh, of the engagement. So for a neurofeedback game, the, like it's like two or three minutes is better. And then depending on the context and uh, mutual wave machine, like some anywhere between seven and a half and 10 minutes, right? So there's, we're really seeing differences in like how much people sustain it, but we haven't tested different, you know, like really tested different visualizations for the mutual wave machine we we're actually expecting that it would because it's such a like in your face experiment we thought that the entrainment would just like push everybody to the max instantly but that didn't happen we didn't we still saw a lot of variation actually and that's really interesting and i'm wondering also um with audio effects as as well so for example if you if you played the heartbeat of each person would that yeah. entrain their heart rates which would then also cause more brain synchrony as well for sure so we haven't done heart rate uh, sonification one thing that i that we are finding is that people are having a much harder time um tagging on to tapping into sound i mean it's i know like consciously that is right so it's very hard to explain to people and for people to understand uh what their sound like a soundscape uh, difference as if they're not professional musicians, for example, but a visual, a visual landscape is much easier to, uh, for them to like remember and to tag on to. So that is, a. Uh, but for sure, like all our sounds, like it's hard to talk well, uh, but all these installation have like very carefully designed sound, uh, um, uh, scapes that are also reflecting synchrony and individual brain frequencies. Uh, so you can build in a lot of richness, but um, it's it's harder to make people aware of it for sure. In my experience, maybe that's not your experience, but that's my Oh experience. no, I'm just curious. That's great, thank you. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Mark. Uh, next question from Saul. Uh, thank you for joining us. Ah, okay, it's, um, my name's actually Chris. Can you hear me all right? Oh, sorry, mm -hmm. thank you. No, that's all right. My, I don't know where the, I'm using a different computer. Um, I felt, was just interested to um, find out whether you've used um, audio delays in your um, devices because when we would um, program um, robotics to um, match in with um, audio, this is to do with animatronics or things like that, we would have to. Um, delay the audio so it arrived because there's a time lag between the commands going to the robots and the robots actually operating and we pick up those sorts of things so that was one of the things that might be worth doing is 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 adding time delays in or video delays in to sync it up in your head because we look at something and go oh there's something wrong with that and the other thing would be if you're going from one person talking to another person talking uh, what we would do would we would put in a, um, a bit like they used to be on the police radios where you press a button and you go, Shh. you're actually putting in a marker. So you're switching from one person talking to another person talking. In that way, you get around the um, person going, oh, they're not listening or they're interrupting me. So you're kind of um, removing those sort of social conditioning, which can override um, people's responses. Oh, that's, that's phenomenal. So you're actually seeing these kinds of... Uh 
um, the, these kinds of delay effects disappear if you build in the like like extra noise or extra delays, basically. Is what yeah, you're we, we would build in a delay and so that the, the, the device would take a long time to move. And so the lip sync is out. You, look, you know, when you watch something on the TV or something like that and the person's going and then the noise comes out or the other way around, it's quite unsettling. Um, because sometimes people lip read more than they realize and all those sorts of things. But eliminating that by shifting the time so it's actually synced with the video, that worked with that. Yeah. And the other thing to stop people over talking each other was to have a sort of like a, a, I suppose you call it like a ceremonial, I finished talking, now it's your turn sort of thing. And that would be so like a little sound or a thing that says, you know, I've stopped talking. And it doesn't, it's not necessary so much nowadays because our, you know, our communications are so much better. But when I was younger, we would have issues with that sort of thing. And you'd have to say, it's your turn to talk sort of thing. Yeah. That would be done. <laughs> Anyway, and that's such that's a long sentence to be saying every single time. So you might as well use a cue for that. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Thank you. Okay. That's really no interesting. Right. I'll look into that. Thank you, Chris. Any other question from the entrance from the audience? I have just one last question. Sorry. Great talk. Thank you, Susan. Uh, I re it's really inspiration. Um, so one thing that I was wondering about, I want to know, based on your experience, all the things that you have done and experiments that you've done, I want to know about how you define empathy, as our lab's name is Empathy Computing Lab. I want to know how you define empathy in, in terms of synchrony, brain synchrony. And I got this question because I saw that ET movie that you said, and you said, more synchrony doesn't mean necessarily good. So how you define empathy with synchrony? Thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, I we use, uh, there's a ton, as you know, there's a ton of different ways uh, to measure empathy or pro-sociology, uh, sociality. Ugh, I can't even speak anymore, but um, um, we are seeing that uh, there's like, I'm finding, for example, that the interpersonal reactivity index and specifically personal distress is consistently a strong predictor of synchrony in our studies, but I know of other studies where it's empathic concern of the scale or the fantasy scale that predicts it and not interpersonal reactivity or maybe some other measure altogether. So that's a I, you know, a little bit of a mess, I would say, or at least um, a, a confusing uh, pattern of results across different labs, getting different results with respect to what kind of empathy or pro-social behavior or metric might predict synchrony. Um, and then in terms of, uh, and I think your point around like the pat the um, uh, more is not always better is really well taken. Um, also, in and and if you think about this in terms of this balancing, uh, so we see that more empathy, like in the like for some of these metrics, is more uh, does correspond to more synchrony. Um, but um, we're also, you know, it it is an open question of whether you might then uh, get better fluctuations. Another question would be, uh, we got you know pair like for us for example it's the average between two people that predict synchrony but you could have an average of two people that are both kind of average e empath empathetic or one person is really empathetic and the other person is not so empathetic that gives the same average but we still we see that that's actually ends up being the best you know model for uh for synchrony which is a little odd right like you might not predict something along those lines um so i think my short answer is that i don't really know and i think it's like a, an area of uh, that merits much more and much more systematic investigation because and i think that by calling it all empathy we're kind of glossing over the core problem like we're we're making we're not making it easier for ourselves and each other because you really have to go to the method section often to see what kind of metric they've been they used um in their study so thank you for that question thank you it was that other question as well um and in our lab we're trying to use vr and not yet but hopefully soon augmented reality to um look at um into brain synchrony as well and i'm just wondering um what your impressions of that are and, and if you're aware of other people's work in that space and what's your thoughts about using you know, you know, vr to be able to explore the space 
I'm sorry, I didn't. Can you repeat the last sentence of your question? Oh, I sorry. I just, um, <clears throat> yeah, my network connections are up and down. I was just saying that we, we in our lab, we're using VR um, to explore um, into brain synchrony, and, and in the near future, um, we'll be used doing AR as well. And I'm just curious about your thoughts about that in terms of what's the, the value of using uh, VR for these types of experiments. And if you're familiar with others working in this space using VR. Yeah, I mean, as, um, I I have not worked with VR, so I find it very hard to have like a good sense of uh, of of like uh, if I can like of the answer to your question uh, per se. I mean, like obviously VR is like uh, one thing that I've seen people uh, in terms of VR or other kinds of simulated environments. Um, is that you can create real worlds with like some experimental control there, right? Like, and that's really a benefit. Like it has a, you have a real world immersive experience. So if you think about, uh, you know, you can bring the real world to the lab or you can bring the lab to the, uh, to the real world. And it seems like what you can do is then do controlled experiments in the laboratory environment. But you know, like that's, you know, like you probably have way better ways of even formulating um, that thought. So um, I'm not, sh so for my line of work, since it, uh, I'm, I'm also finding it extremely important to work with humans in real world environments and like bring them into the scientific process and bring them into the question generation, etc. VR is not something that I would do, but it could see for if I had specific questions around configurations of classroom, like how many student, other students are there in your classroom that might distract you and you can actually manipulate that in a VR experiment, experience or directionality of sound or things I could really see a very rich world of manipulating things in a way that feel like a real like real world environments i don't know if that that was the answer that you were looking for at all but um, i know that's fine i'm just i know i wasn't sure if you're also aware of other groups doing using hyper scanning and fear so um oh, oh hyper scanning and vr i uh i know that there are people who are who are interested in it um like elena like i'm wondering if elena Ilana um, Zion Golumbe, she is doing um, work that might go into the direction of what you are thinking. Um, there's not necessarily, it, it's attention allocation that she does, um, but the but a lot of it is synchrony work as well. So I, I'm not sh entirely sure about the projects that they're currently running, but it might be relevant. Right. Thanks so much. That's great. Thank you. And uh, last question from Kunal. Hi. Uh, hi. Hi, Susan. Thanks for the insightful uh, talk. Um, I think that my question is, I think, somewhat related to what Aladdin and Mark already asked, but just wanted to uh, wanted to know your thought process uh, that goes in designing neurofeedback uh, based installations because I you have done uh, you have made uh, amazing installations. So if you can um, give some insights on like what was the thought process that went uh, went in the specific installation or something? Yeah, um, I. For me, it's really about working with people from different fields. And I think also kind of stepping outside of your turf, right? So the people that I work with best are, I mean, it's not like I'm now suddenly, you know, like it's not like the sound designer becomes the scientist, becomes the dancer or whatever, right? But being um, comfortable enough and giving space to each other to also step across the interdisciplinary boundaries and enter in a conversation with each other, to me was very important for the process. Um, uh, and I felt that teams who trusted each other to also give that those kinds of comp uh, like really, really worked best in generating the installations and uh, experiences. Um, so that I think was the best, was the most, and also working, uh, working not just multidisciplinary, but also multimodally, right? So scientists participated in dance workshops, dancers participated in conversations. And even though that might feel uncomfortable, initially, I think it's like very critical to like cross the boundaries, um, uh, but still stay serious, right? It's not, yeah, as I said, like not, it shouldn't be that sign. Now the scientist is the painter or the other way around. Like you just bring your level, your expertise to the table. Um, that's, I think, uh, um, and having fun <laughs> while doing it. Like that's the, 
that that's ultimately obviously the most uh, most important because I think you can I think we can feel the difference between different projects if we felt inspired ourselves by uh, creating it. Okay. Thank, thanks, Suzanne. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, definitely. I echo having fun in what we do makes a huge impact in in the success um, and making contribution better. Thank you. Thank you so much, Suzanne, for all the for the great work for uh, sharing your thoughts and ideas with us. Uh, we learned a lot. And thank you, everyone who joined and asked questions. I hope you enjoyed uh, this seminar as much as I did. And hopefully yeah. you get to visit us in New Zealand or we get to meet somewhere. That would be phenomenal. <laughs> I hear it's uh, it's the most beautiful place in the world. So I hope to see it sometime. <laughs> it is. Uh, yes. Thank you so much for the invitation. I really appreciate it, and for your amazing questions, they really are were thought provoking, and I'll bring uh, bring them back with me. Uh, uh, yeah, but now I'm going to bed. <laughs> thank you for taking the time. Thanks, Thanks so much. We'll see you later. Right. Thank you. Bye. Um, bye.